Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for being here. We'll get started straight away, but I'll just do some introductions. I'm Jerry Baker. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with such a distinguished panel to discuss uh, the U.S. and the world outlook. I'm joined, of course, by Elaine Chow, U.S. Secretary of uh, Transportation, Kevin McCarthy, Majority Leader of the U.S. House of Representatives, and Kristen, Niels, Kristen Nielsen, the U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security. So let's get straight in. It's obviously, there's a very big, as you may have noticed and you may have read about, there's a big and prominent American delegation this year at the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos. Uh, President Trump arrives tomorrow and addresses the, uh, the forum on Friday. And there's high expectations, I think it's fair to say. And I think it's also fair to say that this is not the kind of crowd that President Trump normally addresses, uh, has addressed either on the campaign trail or uh, since even since he's been president. It's, uh, uh, they have a, probably a rather different global outlook, but they'd be very interested to hear what he's got to say. Se if I can start with you, uh, Madam Secretary, Secretary Chow, what is the message, what is, what, is, what is the president seeking to achieve, first by coming to Davos, and then what is he going, what do you expect him, what do you expect his message to be? And how is he going to engage with the, with, the, with the world community represented here? Well, Davos is a wonderful format. It's a wonderful forum. There are leaders and uh, you know, participants from throughout the world. So I think it's quite a compliment to Davos that the president is coming. So everyone will have to stay tuned and listen. I'm going to get you to <laughs> say a little more than that, if I possibly can, in the next 30 minutes. On what, but if I turn to you, uh, Majority Leader McCarthy. What what do, you, what do you think the president of the United, this president of the United States, who staked his presidential campaign on America First just a year ago? We heard the uh, inaugural speech, America First, uh, make America great again. It's about American doing what's right for America and apparently not being very keen on a lot of trade deals, not being very keen on certain types of immigration. Um, what is the message then that he, you, you want to hear from him and you think the world is going to hear from him this week? Well, I think you're going to hear a couple different things. One, and if you watched in the short time of this presidency, he's had a lot of very successful foreign travel. He's got good relationships there. And you've got to understand what does America first mean, okay? So we wanted to focus on the economics of America. We wanted the citizens to be safe. That means home and abroad. That means in a perspective, Americans are all around the world. We want to help those allies that have the same type of values or desiring that protect their citizens and others. But more importantly, as I sat around Klaus's dinner last night, what's interesting is the number of countries who are now talking about their tax system. And I do believe that with doing something as big as the tax change, it took three decades for anybody to have this happen. The economic of America rising helps the rest of the world, and it also helps from a safety perspective around the world. And I think you'll hear quite about that, but also the future plans from infrastructure, from building, um, one, the greater relationships with other countries, and Davos is a great place to have that happen. Secretary Nielsen, if I may, you're the, you're primarily responsible for protecting the American border, for the uh, responsibility for security at the border. Uh, immigration is obviously an important part of that. Travel into the United States is an important part of that. In the last year, we've seen the president um, continue to urge the building of a wall with Mexico. Uh, we've seen a so-called travel ban that's been imposed to apply to particular countries. Uh, and, and talk of a more restrictive immigration policy. We're still waiting to see, obviously, how that works out in Congress. What's your view? In terms of the message that America, these, all of these acts and all of these, this debate in America is sending to the rest of the world about America's openness, do you worry that sometimes this, uh, that the message that the rest of the world is getting is that, you know what, America's turning its back on the world? Well, first of all, thank you for having us. Appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. I, you know, what I would say is I think that's why we're all here. Uh, we're all here to make it clear, uh, as the leader was saying, that America first is not America alone, uh, that we're here to partner. And whether it's on security or economics or trade or, frankly, any of the issues that we're all gathered here to talk about, we need those partnerships. So within my portfolio, what I would tell you, unfortunately, with the evolving threats of today, there's not one entity that has all the authorities, capabilities, and capacities to address it. So we have to partner. We have to partner with the private sector. We have to partner with international entities. And we have to partner within our own government, within our own interagency, to throw all we have at these problems today. 
Secretary Chauvin, may I ask you, um, again, economic, um, uh, economic nationalism, as it's been called, make America great again, uh, America first. The president has pulled the US out of uh, TPP already. Uh, he's just this week announced some sanctions uh, on a number of uh, companies. Uh, you know, you're responsible for transportation, which I appreciate is a, a multi-faceted uh, portfolio. But is this, are, are the, is, is the United States willing really to continue to engage on a trading basis with the rest of the world? The president has talked about protecting American jobs. I think you have. How much, how much it, it sounds like protectionism. Well, the American economy is just booming. We've had the lowest unemployment rate we've seen in decades. The stock market is at an all-time high. Uh, more jobs have been created in the uh, last year than they have been in previous years. America First is a continuation of the American, uh, the affirmation of American exceptionalism, that America is very special. It's a country where there's hope and opportunity and uh, people from all over the world come to our country with nothing uh, much of the time, many of the times, seeking only the opportunity to succeed. I think those are part and parcel of the message about America as well. And the America First message is also a reflection of what has happened in the previous eight years, that there was a feeling in the previous eight years that America did not take a position which fully um, appreciated America's role abroad. And I think that message from the president has to be taken against the context of the last eight years as well. Congressman McCarthy, you, you, you were shaking your head there, but why is, so far again, pulling out of TPP, threatening to pull out of NAFTA, and for all we know may well pull out of NAFTA, uh, imposing sanctions that we've seen this week, possibility of more sanctions, why, that, that looks protectionist. Why is that not protectionist? It's not. And let, let's first start. Where was the first time you heard to make America great again? President Ronald Reagan. Think about what the world looked like after Reagan was president of the United States. Secondly, it is only right to modernize the NAFTA agreement. NAFTA agreement was created before computers, before technology where we are. It's, and there's nothing wrong with sitting there and negotiating. Now look what just happened on solar panels. And you tell me if this is protectionism or creating fair trade. So, the film that goes over the top of a solar panel is made by Dow Chemical. I'll get the term wrong, so I won't provide it. <laughs> China does not allow them to sell it. Who subsidized solar panels and who puts them into America? Is it only right and fair that you have a president who stands up and says, wait a minute, if we want to have trade, let's have it fair. If you deny an American company from even selling the product or competing, that's not protectionism. That's creating more jobs. So, and then when you look to immigration, we have one of the most liberal forms of immigration in America because we assimilate. We love the process. But there's not one person on any side that's going to tell you our current system is working well. If you, if you look within chain migration, just if you want to bring a brother or sister, it's a 30-year wait. So why don't we create a system that works? Why don't we create a system also, what the president talks about, on merit? Doesn't that really go to breaking the barriers down? Um, so I believe we're <coughs> going to come to an agreement. And let's look back for one moment. If President Trump is able to get tax reform, he's able to get growth back to where America was before and even greater, and get an immigration bill, there are a lot of people who served in that office before who have tried and failed. I think the, the world should take a step back and say, maybe you disagree with a word he says or something, but what are the results? And to give him a little credit around the world, would North Korea be talking to South Korea? And is that America first, or is that making the rest of the world safe? I think he's being successful. Well, but you say you, you know, defend those decisions this week on solar panels and washing machines. But those are tariffs which impose a cost on U.S. consumers. So, they're going to, so it's going to hurt U.S. consumers significantly, especially washing machines. 
And especially, in, again, in that second category, you're also going to be, in terms of the producers, you're actually going to be hurting countries, that more, more countries that the US is trying to, is trying to sit, use it ally, as allies, rather than China, which is the country, at least from an economic competitive basis, is supposed to be the, the country that, we're, that the US is most concerned about. So well, how, does, how, do, how do tariffs really help So if you look, no, look, I'm a true, I'm a big believer in fair trade, free trade. If you take a short-term approach, how many American jobs are going to be lost that Dow Chemical made it all that investment? Creates a product that is very successful, but is denied the ability to even enter the market. There may be a short-term view here, but take a long-term approach. What I think will happen is someone's going to say, whoa, I'm going to wake up. What are you upset about? How do we come to an agreement? Same thing that's probably going to happen with NAFTA. And at the end of the day, Canada, Mexico, and America are going to be stronger for it. I think it will be a win, win, win. And you might not like the tactic that went about it, but I think all three countries will be stronger for it. Do you, like, do you like the tactic? Do you like, do you like the tactic? You, you, you approve of those tariffs? You think it's... Well, listen. So your consumers in... Your, your constituents in California are going to have to pay more for washing machines, and that's... But you think it's worth doing that to protect... To protect a, a small, a small US more industry. for a washing machine in the next month, or I'm more concerned about my community having jobs for the next decade? Because I think at the end of the day, the other items that we tried to stop this before have not worked. So I don't put it on the president for this. I put it on the others who deny the ability to come to a common ground. So you have to raise the temperature, just as other presidents have done in the past, just as Ronald Reagan has done when it comes to Steele and others. You get the debate going. Secretary Nielsen, I hope you're OK, by the way. So you haven't got... <laughs> I went to get a cough drop. <laughs> I hope you haven't got the dreaded Davos, uh, Davos virus. But um, I suppose part of the bigger picture here is what people are concerned about is American leadership. I think we've come in the rest of the rest of the world has come to for the last since the second world since the end of the Second World War to see America seeking to uh, pursue American values uh, and or universal values actually around the world values of freedom or, of democracy um, and and also in doing that has assumed global leadership the United States has assumed global leadership and what we've started to see perhaps in President Trump's rhetoric and in the national security strategy that we saw outlined perhaps is a sense that the US no longer is willing to pay those burden to bear those burdens of global leadership because because there are burdens and some of them are having to put up with things that you don't like in order to move the world more generally in your direction is that true is the US becoming essentially a, just another nation competing with the rest of the world putting America first not putting the world's interests first yeah i would of course, frame it a little bit differently. I think what the leader was describing is this concept of making sure that we have an even playing field, right? So it's not about A or B or C or D. It's allowing the economy to work as it can, allowing in removing, allowing it to work, removing unnecessary restrictions or outdated restrictions. Uh, when it comes to my portfolio, what I would say is that the United States continues to be a leader. Uh, that's our intent. You've seen that this year with global aviation. We've worked a lot uh, with my colleagues at the Department of Transportation as well. Uh, but what you've seen there is we've built coalitions of the willing. We've made the threat clear. Uh, we've provided very specific direction with respect to protective measures. And together, as an international community, we've raised the bar on aviation security. So I think very much we, we still are a leader. We intend to stay there. I don't think, um, well, I think this, you know, all these questions are why the president is coming. And again, I think Davos should feel very flattered that uh, he has chosen this as a forum. I, I hope. Uh, and so for those that don't want to listen to him, you can, they can leave. Yeah. You know, this is part of what discourse and discussion is all about. And so there obviously is a gulf in perception and assumptions. And so I think it's good that uh, the president is coming and that he's explaining himself. I might also add, you know, when we talk about America's role in the, um, around the globe, it's not as if America is going to withdraw. Uh, there are many people who feel that America has been the chump, that, you know, we are part, and we are certainly the key player in a global network that purports to secure peace and security throughout the world. And yet America bears a disproportionate amount 
of the cost. In fact, we pay for everybody else. So I think there is some um, voices that raise the question, should America pay for everybody else's defense structure and infrastructure? Uh, and how long should this continue? And so those are some of the questions that are involved with this America, you know, a, a role overseas. Yeah, Congressman. If I could look at that question, I would almost put it in reverse. I think America has stepped back up on the stage. I think we reaffirmed who our allies are throughout the Middle East, that we do not think Iran should continue. Iran did not end their nuclear program. They just froze it for 10 years. They're testing ballistic missiles. There's no positive in that. North Korea. North Korea has a nuclear weapon and they have ICBMs. The only thing they don't have yet is combining the two together and accurately sending it somewhere. It is not America's interest only to change course and stop that. That is a world perspective. And it wasn't the president who went to go alone. He has engaged China in a manner they haven't engaged in this process before. So I think it's made me the prism of what people look through. There's others who will say, when I travel the globe, thank God America is back on stage again. So I think it's the, in the nature or maybe the philosophy or principles of what you want America to be. I think part of the problem people have is, is the rhetoric and the difference between, the possible difference between the rhetoric and the reality. I think if people look at the policies that the US has pursued in the last year, engagement in the Middle East, uh, as it's continued to do, engagement in Afghanistan, taking a sometimes aggressive, but certainly an engaged approach uh, with North Korea, as well as a diplomatic approach, doing, uh, you know, sh pursuing stro you know, economic policies at home, uh, which, are, which have been, uh, you know, cutting taxes, which have, been very, which have been good for business. And I think people look at that and would say yes. But they look at the language that comes out of the White House, particularly this president, and, and, they, and it worries them. And let me obviously just particularly turn to a, a recent example of that. So when the President of the United States, and I know there's dispute about what was reported and what was said, but when the President of the United States is reported, and it's not widely denied, to have used a scatological obscenity to refer to an entire continent, in the case of Africa, I think people worry that what does this say about this, this President's instincts for all the and again, what, me, what he may say here this week, what, is, what, is, what, is, what does he really think about the rest? And what is America, what values is America presenting to the rest of the world? Secretary Nielsen. Yeah, I, I, what I can tell you is what he means. I won't go into what other people like to put words in people's mouths. Um, what he means is let's look at the individual. It's time to stop looking at immigration based on the country and look at the, look at the individual. What can the individual come and contribute to the United States? How can an individual come and assimilate? How can an individual come become American? That's why we want them to come. So this isn't about limiting legal immigration. This is as the leader was describing before I had my coughing attack. How can we do it so that it helps both sides, those who want to unify their families and the communities and the businesses who need workers, who need skilled workers to come in and help our economy. So it's not, it, it's been falsely framed as a conversation about countries. It's not about the country. Whether we're talking about security and illegal immigration or legal immigration, we're trying to talk about the individual. Is the individual a threat? I don't want them to come to the United States. But you've Is, acknowledged that the president uses, has used hard, whatever he said in that, what he said, he uses harsh, harsh language at times. And people hear that harsh language and they, take things from it. Language has meaning, after all. It, 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 language does have meaning. I would agree with that. But I think he's been clear as to what the context was of that conversation. Uh, the particular conversation was talking about how we do immigration. Should it be based on particular countries or should it be based on skills? And the conversation was about, let's move to an individual skill-based system. I'm not sure there was much more interesting really happening in the meeting at the end of the day. I mean, that was the conversation. Canada has it. Australia has it. New Zealand has it. There's a reason why it works for those countries, because it helps their economies. Let me ask you a, a broader question, about again, about global leadership. Last year at Davos, President Xi Jinping came, gave a very uh, memorable address. It was very well received. Uh, and he was generally interpreted as trying to maybe seize the mantle of 
leadership, at least of the international economic system. He talked about the importance of an integrated uh, global economy, the importance of trade, the importance of uh, you know, communications, of economic communications. And I, as you go around the world, you do detect that the last year or so, many more people around the world see China as stepping up into leadership roles, particularly in Asia. They worry, and these are America's allies, they worry that actually China is seizing the initiative uh, in many of these places around the world and seizing the initiative and talking the language that, that people want to hear. Is, 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 is that a concern that actually with this tough talk about America first and this strong talk about uh, economic nationalism and the need for the US to revisit uh, all of its, uh, many of its international relations, that China moves in and, and, and assume, and this actually helps China assume a bigger role, Secretary Chow? Well, I'm obviously an American of Chinese descent. Uh, so uh, I may see things a little bit differently, but if you were to talk to any Chinese official, they would ask in return, why are you so afraid of us? Because we have, it will take us 40 to 50 years to get to where you, America, is now. The question overall is being who's, why are they being scared is addressed to everyone, but they use as a comparison that it's still gonna take uh, them about 40 to 50 years to get to the level of the standard of living that we now see in the Western world. So China has a complex history and they always talk about the 150 years of humiliation. So from that depth, they are building themselves up. Clearly, they are now a number two country in terms of the economy. They have uh, greater assertiveness because they are now gaining confidence in themselves. And it is a, introducing a new relationship with all the countries in the world, uh, including America as well. So as we go into this new relationship, we're going to have to redefine what our various roles are and how we will react. But uh, America has been number one and it will continue to be number one. Would you one. characterize the mm -hmm. likely relationship as, as more confrontational, adversarial than it's been? Or, or, or are we going to have the same broadly strategic convergence that we've seen over the last 20 years or so? This is not really my field. Uh, on the other hand, because I do believe that I have a sp uh, of my unique perspective, uh, of my cultural understanding mm. and the historical understanding. Um, I think the, uh, the term that's been used a lot, and the leader probably may uh, agree as well, it's called frenemy. Uh, there are issues that we can work with them on. Mm. There are issues that we need their help on, and we all know what those issues are. Mm -hmm. And there will be other issues that we will be in competition. Mm. Natural resources, for example. So with this major player, transforming itself. It is creating tensions, and we have to kind of readjust as to how we interact with one another. Mr. Leader? Leader? Well, let me take the premise of your question. You said the president gave the speech when President Trump was being inaugurated in America, and President Xi was in Davos. Were we afraid of the growth of China? Would you say Trump created any of that? or was the past administration allow the expansion of China? And I would leave it to the world, if you had the choice to do business in America or China, where would you pick? And I don't know how many discussions we'll have here on China. As they expand, they're very open. They're a long-term approach. It's good that we have relationships and trade, but it has to be fair. But when I look at their expansion to Africa and others, I see with one mindset. It's what benefits China for resources and others. That's all well and good, but from the same standpoint, I've watched this president bring President Xi to mar lago I've watched him have discussions, and I've watched him work closer together in dealing with North Korea. And the one part that America ha or the world has to believe, that only makes the relationship stronger and the trust stronger. And then you then you have other countries moving up, India and others. I just believe it's helpful for the entire world to be together, but I would not blame President Trump for something he wasn't even in office for, and I know our allies were concerned about the islands and the others, but I think President Trump has been very strong about that at the same time building a relationship. 
Secretary Nielsen, can I ask you about a, just another country in the context of cyber threats, which is another of your uh, issues that you have to deal with, very pressing issues you have to deal with. And that is, ask you about, there's a range of cyber threats we know, but let's, let me ask about one in particular, which is Russia, and the threat from Russia, organized threat from Russia. The other day, the, um, just this week, the, you, the British Army's Chief of Staff, Nick Cohen, said that Russia now represented the most complex and capable security challenge that we, meaning we, the UK, but also NATO, uh, have faced since the Cold War. Uh, and he actually talked about the probability of essentially a massive attack uh, from Russia. What, obviously, we, we've all been through the issue of Russian interference in the US election and possibly in other elections. What is, what is the US doing to protect itself, to strengthen itself from this, what looks like, quite significant, quite ominous uh, threat from Russia? Yeah, I, I, I don't know that we have enough time to tell you everything we're doing. You have about I mean, I, I, yeah, I think at a, at a very high level, uh, we're working very closely with our states and localities, the Department of Homeland Security is, uh, to ensure the integrity of our election systems. That's very important. Uh, we're also working with companies and other countries to have the conversation about what is presented on the internet uh, and the disinformation and whether there is hacking for the purpose of changing the integrity of our information. We all rely on information. If we can't rely on information, then it's very hard to govern as a country. So I think it's those two. I would also suggest, you know, we, we have seen attacks emanating from that country. Uh, to critical infrastructure, and that is of highest concern to the Department of Homeland Security. So we're working very closely with the owners and operators, everything from vulnerability assessments to best practices to giving them the indicators through automated means so they can quickly protect their systems. Uh, but we need to have that conversation as an international community. It's not a fair fight to have a nation against a company. So we all need to figure out where our red lines are, what we're comfortable, what behavior is appropriate via the internet. Uh, if these were happening in the kinetic world, we would, nobody would be comfortable with them. So we, it's time for frameworks. It's a time to align rules. Uh, that's part of why I'm here. I'm having a lot of cyber conversations why I'm here. can get very detailed very quickly, as you know. Uh, but at a high level, it's about roles and responsibilities and who's going to do what to protect what when. And I think it's true to say that it's not a question of if. Uh, it's just a question of how often. So how do we innovate why we're being attacked? How do we mitigate why we're being attacked? How do we partner to get the information out quickly? And I think that's what we're doing at the department. Thank you. One final question to all of you, quite quickly. Um, there are a lot of, as we've talked about some of them, gap between the rhetoric and the reality. There are a lot of, I think, misconceptions that people have uh, about America, generally. It's the most, it's a paradox of modern media that it's the most, it's the most, it's the most observed, but often the most misunderstood country on earth, I think. And this administration certainly has had a fair amount of um, attention, which has not been very favorable. If I ask all of you, what's the, what's the, most, important, what's the most important misconception? What are people, as they, as they look at America, and we see these polls that show America, the world, many people in the world don't trust America, they don't trust the Trump administration, they're fearful, they actually think it's threatening. What, 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 are, what, are, what is the rest of the world getting wrong? about this administration, this Congress, about what, what the United States is looking to do in the world? Oh my goodness, where do we start? Any of you? I, I would say this. America has the same fiber. We are different than almost any other country because we're conceived in liberty and dedicate the proposition that all men and women are created equal. We're one of the one few countries in the world that will give the ultimate sacrifice of our own lives for other countries to have freedom. We will never change from that. When America is strong economically, we can foster those values and those fibers around the world. We are beginning a comeback that we have not had in quite some time. Our economic growth brings so much more, not just to America, but to the world. And we are free and willing to share that. We like the idea of sharing ideas. We want others to have that freedom. And that is the fiber of who we are and we'll never change from that. And we're willing to stand up and fight for it. So somebody asked, asked me what time, what does an American look like? It looks like you. It looks like this audience. We are all of you. We reflect the rest of the world. And America is indeed. That's why there is, it is a country where there's so much opportunity. And that's still true, that America still wants to be a nation of immigrants and a nation of 
a country that, that welcomes people from around the world and represents the best ideals. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that is a common misperception, and particularly in my portfolio with security, somehow security is framed uh, in a negative sense and in a restrictive sense and in a un-American sense. It's none of those things. We have a responsibility as a country to know who's coming into our country and why, uh, and that's where we're focused, and we're focused on that in partnership. So we're working with other countries. They have that same responsibility to their citizens. But again, if we're all safe, we can all prosper. So there are those who want to do us all harm. Let's work together to prohibit that harm. That's what I'm trying to do. The rest of the conversation, I'm not really sure where it, where it goes and how we get there. Uh, but it's about partnering. It's about protecting our own, protecting our citizens, protecting your citizens, working together in partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, we're out of time. Uh, we've had a terrific panel, two, three very distinguished members of the United States government, two members of the cabinet, majority leader of the uh, House of Representatives. Please uh, join me in thanking them for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you.